So we'll talk here about some disorders of the pediatric hip and knee. And a lot of these disorders come up very commonly on the USMLE, so you'll want to pay extra close attention to these. So the pediatric hip and knee are common places to see orthopedic disorders. And uh, we'll start out, I try to arrange these sort of in the order in which you would see them chronologically. So developmental dysplasia of the hip is usually something that's going to present in uh, infants, babies, newborns. Uh, septic arthritis tends to affect toddlers most, but does have a, uh, uh, an increased incidence in pediatrics overall when compared to adults but that can happen at any point during childhood. Leg calve perthes disease uh, is another one, usually in elementary school age children. Skiffy is usually in middle school age children. And then osgood schlatter disease, another one that's in roughly middle school age children, uh, adolescents. Okay, so developmental dysplasia of the hip is a common disorder in the newborn. And it's most commonly seen in female infants, particularly female infants who are the firstborn to that particular mother, and uh, infants that were born in the breech presentation. And the reason for that is pretty clear. The obstetrician has to manipulate the legs if they're in breech presentation. They have to deliver them in usually uh, unorthodox manners. And so uh, having the baby in the breech position uh, puts them at risk for uh, having their, their hip thrown out of alignment. So female infants, firstborn, and breech. There is an increased incidence in Native Americans, one in a thousand, which is quite common when you think of things population-wise. Uh, and so if you work with that particular population, it's something to keep in mind. But DDH is something to keep in mind no matter what, really. Physical examination is going to be where you note this. Developmental dysplasia of the hip is not something that is physically obvious. Um, just, I mean, looking at, uh, at, at, the, at, at the baby. So uh, this isn't something that parents are going to come to you uh, and, and tell you that uh, they've noticed. So this is why in every newborn examination, it's really, really important that you're looking for this because otherwise it might go undetected. The Ortolani maneuver is the way that we screen for, uh, for developmental dysplasia of the hip. And what the Ortolani maneuver is, is you're taking the baby's legs, and usually you can do both of them at the same time, although technically you're supposed to do one at a time. Uh, you take the baby's legs, you flex the knee, and then you abduct the hip. Uh, so abducting the hip with the knees flexed. And now you're going to have, uh, your, usually it's your thumb and your pointer finger, on either side of uh, the baby's, uh, where the, the femoral head would be, the acetabulum area. And uh, what you're feeling for is a clunk. And you'll feel that clunk when you abduct the hip. And what's happening is that as you abduct the hip, if the baby has DDH, what's happening is that you're, you're putting the, the femoral head back into alignment. And that's that clunk feeling that you're moving the hip back into, you're moving the femoral head back into the correct position. And so I should mention that dysplasia of the hip, what you have is a, uh, a dislocation, a, a more, more so uh, a subluxation of the, of the femoral head uh, to the acetabulum. So it's not corresponding uh, as it should into the, uh, into the, the, cavity where uh, the the femoral head should go. The femoral head is not where it should be uh, relative to the hip. So when you feel that clunk, you're actually moving it into the correct position. And, and that uh, would be considered a positive Ortolani sign. And a positive Ortolani sign is generally diagnostic of developmental dysplasia of the hip. However, you will need to get uh, sonography in order to confirm that. Other things that you might notice on the baby on physical exam without doing the Ortolani maneuver, but you do still need to do it, uh, are uneven gluteal folds. And so when you look at a baby, and a lot of them are kind of pudgy, uh, you, you will notice those kind of little fat rolls that they have. Those should be more or less... Uh, symmetrical from side to side. So if you if you have some asymmetry going on there, that may uh, that may indicate that you have something abnormal going on on one side. 
Now the presentation may be different in an older baby, and by older I mean more than three to six months roughly. Remember the newborn we're talking about usually is less than a month old. With an older baby, uh, it it may be slightly different presentation and you may not get a positive Ortolani sign. Why is that? As the baby gets older, the the hip starts to all all of the 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 bones and the uh, and the ligaments they start to uh, they start to get stronger they start to uh, calcify and the position is more fixed so what happens is that if you try to do the Ortolani maneuver on a much older baby particularly older than six months you will not get an you you won't get that clunk because you won't be able to replace manually replace the femoral head back into the acetabulum it'll just remain in that uh, in that uh, abnormal position so even it, even though you flex uh, uh, even though you abduct the hip with the knees flexed you're not going to be able to replace the femoral head into the acetabulum, so you won't get that palpable clunk. It'll be a false negative. So remember that in children that haven't had their newborn exam, if they haven't been seen and they're older than three to six months, you may not get a positive Ortolani sign and they may indeed have DDH still. So that's something important to remember. What you can look at uh, is that if you flex the knee, you would have a discrepancy in the leg length. And so that would be what you would look for in an older child, in an older, uh, older baby, more than three to six months old. But most of the time when the USMLE gives you a vignette of a patient that they want to tell you has DDH, it's going to be a, a newborn just so they can give you that positive Ortolani sign, and uh, which is normally how they present. Most most babies do get their newborn examinations and so you will pick this up early but uh, if if they don't get that newborn examination uh, you, you uh, it's important to remember that Ortolani sign is not always going to be there. It's, uh, it, it will go away eventually just because the uh, the femoral head will become fixed in that position. As you go on older and older and older, it's going to be difficult to diagnose just on your physical exam. Usually what's going to happen is when the when the, the baby starts to walk, which is around a year old, the parent will notice a limp and then definitely the kid will be brought in and the limp is certainly not something that should happen in a, in a baby when they start to walk. So for diagnosis, even though our uh, positive Ortolani sign is, is quite sensitive and specific, especially when picked up early for DDH, you're still going to need to get sonography to make the diagnosis. Now, why do we use sonography and not an x-ray? You can use an x-ray. However, in babies, in newborns, the bones aren't sufficiently calcified. And so sonography is going to be a more, uh, it's going to be a better way to make the diagnosis. It'll be, it, it'll yield better results. Now, you, I don't suspect you're going to be asked to interpret a sonogram of uh, dysplasia on the USMLE. However, that is the best diagnostic test for newborns uh, with DDH. If you've gotten a positive Ortolani sign, you'll need to get the sonography to make the confirmation. Now, if it's an older child if it's older than I would say six months definitely if they're closing in on a year then you can get an x-ray because their bones will be su uh, sufficiently calcified to where you'll actually be able to see the abnormality and I'm gonna show you x-rays I'm not gonna show you sonograms I'm gonna show you x-rays and that's just because I want you to be able to see what's going on uh, the, the, what you see on the x-ray is the exact same thing as what's going on in in the the little babies it's just you won't be able to see it on x-ray you would only be able to see it on sonogram in the little babies but it would look the exact same if you could see it on x-ray okay the treatment for developmental dysplasia of the hip that's going to rely on age and that's just because with uh, with growing up the the 
the hip will become fixed in the position that it's in. So if it's a, a newborn, usually six months or younger, we're going to be able to treat the DDH simply with uh, bracing. And so it'll be very conservative therapy. We'll use what's called a Pavlik harness, and the baby will need to wear it usually for about, I think it's about 12 to 16 weeks or so, and, uh, and that will generally fix the dysplasia. You're just holding the, the, uh, the, the hip in that normal, or in that, uh, in that Ortolani position so that the hip will develop and, and, and calcify and fix into that normal position. In babies that are a little bit older, six to 24 months, the preferred treatment is going to be closed reduction and this will be done by an orthopedic surgeon. And in children that are much older, two, two years or older, they're going to actually need surgery to fix this dysplasia. Okay, so I wanted to show you an x-ray, not because an x-ray is the preferred treatment most, or the preferred diagnostic test for confirmation most of the time, but because an x, the x-ray will show you kind of what's going on here so you can get a visual idea of what DDH is. So this is a normal hip x-ray and I couldn't find any normal hip x-rays of children. This is so I found one of a uh, found one of an adult and really it's they're going to look pretty much the same anyway. Uh, so what you can see and what's most important here is that the femoral head is consistent with the base of the acetabulum. So this is the acetabulum here. It's the uh, the little cavity where the femoral head goes in and then this of course is the femur and this is the femoral head. So here's your femoral head and it's consistent with the acetabulum on both sides. Okay now uh, I also wanted to point out that there are these lines that you can draw. Two of them, one of them is going to be a line over the top of the femoral head so from one femoral head to the other and you should be able to draw this nice straight line between the two femoral heads. And this is called the Hilgenreiner line. So some, some German decided to name it after themselves. And then you should be able to draw a line straight down the spine. And this, these two lines together should be perpendicular, more or less, 90 degrees. Okay, so here's developmental dysplasia of the hip. What you see here is on the right side, the, uh, the, the, the femoral head is consistent with the acetabulum. Here's your acetabulum, here's your femoral head. Yep, there we go. This is your femoral head and your acetabulum. So consistent. Here, the femoral head is out of alignment with the, here's, uh, with the acetabulum. So here's your acetabulum right here, femoral head not in alignment and it's posteriorly dislocated. So that's why when we abduct the hip, we get a, uh, the clunk because you're moving this, uh, this femoral head into alignment with the acetabulum and it slides in and that's what causes that clunk. And that clunk is, is, is it's not necessarily something that you are going to hear, it's something that you're going to feel. And it kind of feels like, I've only felt it a couple times uh, in my life, I don't work with children, but what it feels like is like when you turn a light switch on and off. Uh, you get that sort of, uh, that, just that little subtle clunk. And, and you'll know it because you won't feel anything in a normal child, but with DDH you will feel something there when you're doing your Ortolani test. So this is posteriorly dislocated. Okay, here's our Hilgenreiner line. So this is the top of the femoral head on the right side and the top on the left side. And you can see we've got this uh, abnormally, uh, it's not straight. And then the line down the middle of the spine and you can see they're out of alignment. And that points towards DDH. Now in young babies, less than three to six months, we're not gonna be able to do an X-ray, so it's not gonna be this easy to make the diagnosis, but in an older infant uh, or child, we can use an X-ray. Here's another one. So uh, here's, again, this one's on the right side again. So here's the, uh, 
the, the femoral head and the acetabulum. This is normal here on the right side. On the left side, you've got the dislocation. So here's our acetabulum, and the femoral head is posteriorly dislocated. There's our Hilgenreiner line and the spinal line. So what do we do for diagnosis? We are going to do sonography, and uh, if it's uh, a newborn, and usually they are, and then we confirm that uh, with a pelvic x-ray. Uh, if it's uh, an older child, uh, if we, we can try a pelvic x-ray, uh, but it's not necessarily needed, especially if they're younger. But the best initial diagnostic uh, step is sonography. The treatment is going to rely on age. Six months or younger, we can brace them with the pavlik harness. If they're six to 24 months, it's going to be a closed reduction. And if they're older than two years of age, open reduction. And this is a little baby in the pavlik harness. You can see here, they're fixed in that Ortolani position. So this is the position that they're in when you feel that clunk, because that clunk is actually the sensation of moving the femoral head back into the acetabulum. So what this pavlik harness does is it fixes their femoral head into the acetabulum, so it matures that way and uh, and so that they don't get a, a, a fixed abnormality. And this baby is quite happy. This is not painful for the baby. Okay, septic arthritis. So this is an acute infection of the joint. A lot of times you're gonna see it in the hip joint. So I even wrote acute infection of the hip joint. This is the most common place to see septic arthritis, uh, per particularly in toddlers. Uh, and I should say this is the most common place to see septic arthritis when it's just septic arthritis. Now you can get septic arthritis as a complication of osteomyelitis, uh, in which case it can really affect any joint. But when it's just septic arthritis alone, most commonly it is in the hip joint. This is relatively frequent in toddlers, and as I mentioned, it is often a complication of osteomyelitis in some cases, um, but it can be just isolated septic arthritis. So the history, you should always keep a high index of suspicion in any acute joint pain, particularly in the very, very young. We see joint pain in older patients, and that can be juvenile RA, that can be uh, other things, but in, in the really, really young, septic arthritis tends to be the most common cause. You should ask about their uh, vaccination status to Haemophilus type B, and that's going to be uh, really important because uh, Haemophilus B is a common cause of septic arthritis. And of course, if it's an older child, make sure and ask them about their sexual activity because that can also be a cause. Gonococcal arthritis can also cause septic arthritis. So there's various causes. Um, so the history is going to be important. As far as symptoms, what you're going to note is that it's a child with a, an exquisitely tender joint. Sometimes you'll note an effusion. However, that can be difficult to note just based on physical exam alone. If it's in the hip, the child will usually hold the hip externally rotated. And that's a common position because that tends to be the least painful because what you've got when you're externally rotated, as we saw with this baby here, you've got your, uh, your femoral head right into the acetabulum. So it's not it's not impeding on the synovial uh, space as much as if you were to have it in a different position. So this is the most natural position for the femoral head into the acetabulum. It's the most, uh, it's the most, I don't say natural position, but it's, it's, the, uh, it's the easiest position for the femoral head to be in because it's right inside that acetabulum. Now, when they're in pain, uh, they're, they're going to tend to hold it in that position. They don't want to have it in any other position because at that point, then it's rubbing up against the synovium, which is infected, and that's going to cause pain. So the child will tend to hold the hip externally rotated. But overall, you're going to see tenderness in the joint, as you would expect in septic arthritis, in any kind of arthritis. 
For diagnosis, you should have labs, and I would imagine that the USMLE will give you labs. The labs you're going to want to get are a CBC, of course. That's going to point you towards uh, an infectious process, so elevated white count, elevated neutrophils. And uh, another thing that you may see is an elevated ESR. That's something that the USMLE might give you. The ESR, remember, it's just a, uh, it's just a nonspecific marker of inflammation. And so uh, elevated ESR with joint pain generally points to septic arthritis. The best initial diagnostic step, however, is not labs. You want to have labs already. But the best initial diagnostic step, uh, if you suspect septic arthritis, which you will if you have an elevated ESR, elevated white count, and, uh, and uh, a clinical picture of, of septic arthritis, the best initial diagnostic step is going to be a synovial fluid aspiration. And usually with kids, we have to do this under anesthesia because we're going to be poking into a joint that's already painful for them, and a lot of kids aren't going to let us do this. So we need to do it under anesthesia. Whereas with adults, teenagers maybe even, we might be able to get an aspiration just by telling them to you know, suck it up and man out the pain. With, with little kids, we have to do a lot of things that we might not, for adults, have to do under anesthesia. So synovial fluid aspiration under anesthesia, and the anesthesia is just simply to make this easier. And what we would expect in septic arthritis, because this is a, uh, a, a, a pyogenic disorder of the synovial fluid, because we have bacteria in the synovial fluid, we should note white cells in the synovial fluid. And we're going to want to culture that joint fluid because we want to know exactly what organism it is. Now the most common organism is Staphylococcus aureus and that's going to be where we're going to point our therapy as far as uh, antibiotics. We may see other staph as well and Neisseria gonorrhea is also a possibility in sexually active children. The treatment is going to be surgical decompression of the joint fluid, which would be done by uh, a surgeon, and IV antibiotics. Various antibiotics you can use. A lot of times you, uh, you use a uh, first-generation cephalosporin. You could also, uh, since we're going after staph aureus most of the time, you could use a semi-synthetic penicillin. Either of those would be acceptable. Okay, here's a child with septic arthritis. You can see them holding that in that same position that baby in the pavlik harness was in, that externally rotated position with the knee flexed. So this is just a position. That they're not forced to hold it in this position. This is the position they hold it in because it's the least painful. And children just will do whatever they can to reduce their pain, just like out, just like the rest of us. But they won't be able to tell you, hey, this is the position that makes me feel better. They'll just hold their leg in that position. And so one of the difficult things about dealing with really, really young children is that they might not be able to communicate to you that uh, this position is most comfortable. You're just going to have to assume, since they're holding it in that position, it's probably because it's the most comfortable. All right, leg calve perthes disease. This is a vascular necrosis of the femoral head, and it's in this big long name named after three different people. Why? I don't know, but it is just simply a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. There's a male to female preponderance of four to one, and it most commonly presents in school-aged children around four to 10 years of age. The cause of leg calve perthes disease is unknown. Uh, however, there is an association with hyperactivity, small stature, and delayed bone age. So those are some things that you may see in a vignette of a patient with leg calve perthes disease. The symptoms, what sets this apart from uh, some of the other diseases is that this is an insidious onset. So this comes on very gradually. And classically, it presents as a limp because this is a necrosis of the femoral head. So you're going to have abnormality of the hip. 
So you will have a limp, and usually this is happening in patients who are already walking, so this will be manifested in how they walk. Uh, but most of the time, this will be a painless limp. So um, the, the disorder here is not in the synovium. The disorder here is inside the bone. So most of the time, this isn't painful. This is just a painless limp. And the, the child is brought in by the parent, and the parent says, my kid is limping. The kid isn't going to get into the car and drive uh, over to the doctor because they can't walk normal. The... Uh, parent uh, is, is the one that's going to bring the kid in, complaining of their limp. Uh, however, what I do want to, uh, what I do want to uh, note is that there are some patients who do complain of pain, and uh, so that pain can be, uh, it can be hip pain, thigh pain, or knee pain. So all of these diseases that we talk about, uh, leg cavity perthes and uh, skiffy, they're disorders of the hip, but the pain can refer down to the knee. Uh, so just please keep that in mind. So um, just to kind of recap that uh, this is an insidious onset. It's less painful than skiffy, which we'll talk about next. And that's kind of why I wanted to say it's the classic painless limp. But there can indeed be pain in leg calvae perthi. So not having pain does not mean, or sorry, having pain doesn't mean that it's not leg calvae perthi. You can have pain with leg calvae perthi, but classically it's the painless limp. What you'll see on physical examination is the limp. And it's uh, you, often you'll see what's called the Trendelenburg gait. It's just this kind of limp where you're kind of moving up and down. I can't really describe it verbally, but if you YouTube it or Google it and look up Trendelenburg gait, you'll see what it looks like. It's very, very particular. This gait can also be described as antalgic, and antalgic just means it's a gait that's, uh, that's done to reduce the pain if there is any. Okay, so this is leg calvae perthes, and what you see here is necrosis in the femoral head, and it's on the left side here. So this is, appears to be normal. This is uh, your necrosis going on here. Much more, uh, much more obvious here on the left side. It could be bilateral. You can have, you can have bilateral disease with this, but most of the time it's unilateral. And in this case, it's much more affected on the left side. So here's another one. This one appears to possibly be bilateral. You see a little bit here and a little bit here. And what what you're no, what you're noting on on the uh, on on the the x-ray is just this uh, calcified necrosis. So you have necrosis inside the femoral head and then it calcifies. And then here's another one. You get it right here on the left side. You don't see anything, you don't see any calcified necrosis on the right side, it's just on the left side here. And then here again on the left side. What is our differential for leg calvae perthes? What is our differential for this limp? Well, first off, we've got osteomyelitis and pyogenic arthritis, which I should say it's the same as septic arthritis that we just talked about. So osteomyelitis and septic arthritis, these tend to have an acute onset. They're quite painful. Most of the time, the patients are going to have a fever. They'll have increased white count. So you look for these classic signs of inflammation and uh, bacterial process. And most importantly, it's an acute onset. Leg calvae perthes is uh, more subtle. It comes on subacutely or chronically. So uh, that's how you can differentiate it from those two. Juvenile RA tends to be a polyrumalgia, so it's not going to be simply in their hip. It may be in their hip as well as in the contralateral knee and in their fingers. Uh, so that's uh, definitely different from leg calvae perthes. Leg calvae perthes is just in the hip and it may refer pain to the knee, but uh, JRA is a polyrumalgia. It's going to affect many, many more spots than just the hip. Skiffy, which we'll talk about next, the slipped capital femoral epiphysis, uh, is uh, 
usually in acute onset, and it's also in older patients. So whereas Lake Calve Perthes is sort of your elementary school age children, four to 10 years, Skiffy is older middle school age to early high school age children, uh, adolescents, 10 to 16 years of age. Skiffy has a pr uh, predominance in uh, overweight patients as well. So that's something to look out for. And then neoplasm is not something that you can really rule out just looking at the patient clinically. They may have similar symptoms, but you will usually be able to uh, note this on x-ray. You'll be able to see the neoplasm on x-ray. And the neo, uh, with neoplasm, if that's indeed the cause, the x-ray will be inconsistent with leg calve perthes. You're not going to note any uh, necrosis of the femoral head. As you probably gather, the diagnosis is with a pelvic x-ray, and that's where you'll note that ossification uh, where the necrosis is at the femoral head. And the treatment is going to vary. I do not expect the USMLE, actually I can almost guarantee you the USMLE is not going to ask you how to treat leg calve perthes disease because it is somewhat controversial and actually some surgeons don't even treat it. Some surgeons just let it be. But most of the time, the uh, common agreement is that casting and crutches are in order. It's never going to be open surgery. So casting and crutches is what I would say would be the treatment uh, if the USMLE did ask you, but I don't expect them to ask you the treatment because there's so much disagreement. What's most important to remember with leg calve perthes, it's younger children, four to 10 years of age, diagnose it with pelvic x-ray and you should know what, it, what that pelvic x-ray looks like with leg calve perthes disease. You have that necrosis, kind of calcified looking uh, uh, stuff right around the femoral head here, uh, I showed you. And then this is a brace. If they do treat leg calve perthes with bracing, this is what they use. Okay, so Skiffy, slip capital femoral epiphysis. This is on your differential for leg calve perthes, and leg calve perthes is going to be on your differential for Skiffy. So what slipped capital femoral epiphysis is, or skiffy, is a separation of the femoral head from the main femur uh, at the epiphysis. So remember your, sorry, this should say at the uh, physis. So not at the epiphysis, at the physis. Uh, so the physis is the growth plate. And what you have is uh, this growth plate, which is where the, uh, which is how the, the the, any of the long bones, how they grow, uh, this growth plate is somewhat tenuous and it's easy, it, it's, it's weaker. And so with Skiffy, what you're getting is a separation of the rest of the bone from the femoral head. And it's at the, the physis, the growth plate, where that's happening. So there's a male to female preponderance in Skiffy. It's two to one. However, it is rare overall. Classically on the USMLE, you're going to see this in obese children, usually in adolescents, teenagers, up to 16 years old. Risk factors include obesity as well as uh, significantly short or tall stature and endocrine disorders. So something you could think about is uh, a lanky patient with Marfan syndrome or your, uh, your, your lanky patient with long extremities who's got Klinefelter syndrome. Those could be a presentation with Skiffy. Uh, but obesity is the one that's most commonly associated, probably because we have some, so much darn obesity in this country anyway. Symptoms and physical. So here you're going to have hip pain. This is never painless, unlike Lake Calve Perthes, that can be painless. This is never painless. This is always painful. And it's going to be hip pain that tends to refer to the knee. And it may actually present as knee pain. It just, remember, pain is, is just how the patient describes it. So if the pain feels worse for the patient in their knee, they're going to say, my knee hurts. And so if, they, if, if a child presents with knee pain, you can't rule out Skiffy. Even though Skiffy is a disorder of the hip, there's nothing wrong with the knee. If you have pain at the knee in a child who's uh, in this age range 
roughly 10 to 16 years of age, you can't rule out Skiffy. That has to be that should be at the top of your differential diagnosis. So hip pain that tends to refer to the knee, they're going to have difficulty bearing weight, and of course they're going to have an abnormal gait uh, simply to reduce the pain. A lot of times it'll be seen as a Trendelenburg gait, and it's just because that Trendelenburg gait is the gait that uh, is the least painful for them. These patients also have a tendency to hold their affected hip in an externally rotated position, and they will also externally rotate their hip on knee flexion, and that's probably similar to uh, for similar reasons to uh, why uh, those babies with septic arthritis hold their legs in a similar position, uh, just simply because of the dislocation and that this is a much more uh, comfortable position for them to be in. So most important to remember, most common in obese children, and that this is a separation of the femoral head at the physis, at the growth plate. So here's an x-ray, and you may not notice it. It's kind of difficult. Look here on the right side. It's normal. You can see your physis. Here's your growth plate right here looks a little bit different from the rest of the, you can see this line here, and this is where your femoral neck is, and this is the femoral head, and then this is the rest of the femur here. Here, though, we have the femoral head, and we have a separation, and so this is where our separation is. This is dislocated backwards, and our, the rest of the, uh, the femur should be down here, but instead it's way up here. And so here's our separation. So skiffy is a separation at the growth plate. Here's another one. This is much more apparent, maybe because it's bigger. Uh, but you can see it's normal here on the right side, abnormal here on the left side. Just a radiology tip. We're symmetric animals. So if you ever notice something that's not the same on one side, as it is on the other, there's probably something wrong. So here's, uh, here's our dislocation. And it's posteriorly dislocated. So again, this is probably why these kids like to hold their legs in that, uh, that externally rotated position, because you're sliding the, the, the femoral neck back into the position that it's supposed to be in. And another one. Okay, now the treatment is surgery, uh, but this is a post-op picture. It's screwed right back in. Skiffy is a very, 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 very emergent diagnosis, uh, so we want to treat this as quickly as we can. So let's talk about how we treat this. So, um, the diagnosis, of course, you probably gathered, is a pelvic x-ray. The differential is uh, leg calve perthes disease. With that, you'll note necrosis at the femoral head on your x-ray. A femoral neck fracture, you'll also note on x-ray. And then a stress fracture, you'll also note uh, on x-ray. And both with the femoral neck fracture and the stress fracture, you won't have that dislocation at the growth plate. Okay, how do we treat this? It's going to be internal fixation internal fixation and then the screwing of the uh, femoral neck back into the femoral head into the position that it's supposed to be in because remember when you have something that's affecting the growth plate you're going to affect further growth and so that's why it needs to be treated right away this isn't something that's going to kill them if you don't treat it but it's going to affect their growth and growth is permanent so it needs to be put back into alignment so that they grow normally and the femur of all of all bones is the most important bone that needs to grow uh, symmetrically and normally because it affects our height, and and that's something that you know you could have uneven arm length and you know you you can probably get by with that, but if you have uneven leg length, you're going to walk around with a limp the rest of your life. So very 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 important to address this promptly. Um, and another concern is a vascular necrosis. Osgood Schlatter disease. So now this is a different disorder we're talking about. This is solely of the knee. 
So up until now, we've been talking about disorders of the hip, namely disorders of the femoral head as it relates to the acetabulum, as it relates to the growth plate. Now we're talking about a disorder strictly of the knee. So this has nothing to do with the hip. And osgood schlatter disease is a uh, disorder that results from repetitive traction of the quadriceps ligament on the tibial tubercle. So the tibial tubercle in teenagers is not yet matured. It's not yet calcified. And so it's, it's not yet ready to take on a whole lot of stress from the quadriceps ligament. And the quadriceps ligament is a single ligament that comes from four muscles. It's a common ligament and it inserts on the tibial tubercle. And so it's the tibial tubercle that takes all the stress whenever you're activating your quadriceps. The quadriceps are important for things like squatting, jumping, uh, kneeling if you're not putting your knees on the floor. So things like that. The, 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 this catcher here is in a typical position that would result in osgood schlatter disease. So osgood schlatter disease, um, when we're thinking about it in the United States, we have to think about sports and things in the United States that would cause it. And one of the very, very, very typical things that cause osgood schlatter disease is a young baseball player who is a catcher. These catchers sit in, if you don't know how baseball is played, these catchers catch the ball from the pitcher and they're constantly in this squatting position. So how better to get Osgood Schlatter than to constantly be squatting and then have to jump up to throw the ball back to the pitcher. They're constantly putting traction on that tibial tubercle and so this is a classic way to develop Osgood Schlatter. The male-female ratio is four to one. Up until now, all of the, the disorders, including now, all the disorders have a male preponderance uh, with the exception of DDH. And this is most common in that adolescent age group. And the symptoms are going to be knee pain, especially on kneeling. And why is that? Because the disorder is at the tibial tubercle. And the tibial tubercle is roughly in the area of the knee. And they're gonna note it especially on kneeling. Not only because you've got a disorder of the tibial tubercle which receives all that stress from the quadriceps, but also because the tibial tubercle gets a little bit of inflammation and that's gonna cause pain. And when you're kneeling on the floor, your tibial tubercle is, is pressed right up against the floor. And so that's going to elicit the pain. So important to keep in mind when you're looking in, into the patient's history, what are the things that the patient engages in? And a lot of these patients are going to be kids that are involved in sports. So gymnastics, track and field, where they're, especially if they're doing things like jumping, uh, basketball, but especially this baseball stuff, because these catchers are in these posi this position all the time, and this is really, really stressful on, on those ligaments. So this is a, uh, a look of what osgood Slaughter may present like. You're not always going to get this knob on the tibial tubercle. It may not be that severe, but here's your, your knee here, and then your uh, tibial tubercle is, uh, is, is right here. So you got your knee, and then your tibial tubercle. And it's this little bump here. So on the USMLE, it may, they may just tell you it's pain at the knee, and it's, uh, the history is a kid who's involved with sports, and it's knee pain, uh, especially on kneeling on the floor. But you may, also get a his, uh, you may also get a question that tells you on physical exam, you see this bump right underneath uh, the knee, and that's uh, the tibial tubercle in, in, in an inflamed state. Okay, so physical examination, you'll note point tenderness right over the tibial tubercle. That makes sense because that's where the disease is going on. You've got some inflammation going on there, and it may be enlarged like we saw in that picture before, but it doesn't necessarily have to be enlarged. The pain is going to be on anything that puts traction on the tibial tubercle, so jumping, crouching, squatting. Now, it's just as important to know what you see in osgood schlatter disease as what you don't see. And what you don't see in osgood schlatter disease are hip pain or thigh pain because this is not a disorder of the hip. It's strictly 
constricted to the tibial tubercle and that uh, quadriceps ligament. So you will not see thigh pain, you will not see ankle or hip pain. You will see a negative drawer test. Remember the drawer test on physical examination is where we test for dislocation of the knee. And so you would see a positive drawer test if the patient had a knee dislocation. That could cause knee pain, but on osgood Schlatter disease, the, the knee is not dislocated. All you have is a, a diseased tibial tubercle. So you will not have uh, a positive drawer test and that indicates that you ha don't have any instability of the knee and the patient should have full range of motion. The diagnosis is clinical and it should be apparent based on what activities uh, the patient has involved themselves in, what makes the pain worse, that point tenderness over the tibial tubercle, uh, but uh, an x-ray can be ordered to confirm your clinical diagnosis and what you'll see is fragmentation at the tibial tubercle and I'll show you an x-ray of that. On physical, uh, sorry this should be treatment, for treatment it's going to be simply rest and analgesics and that goes, that goes for most sports injuries and this is really a sports injury. So here's osgood Schlatter disease, so here's your patella Here's the uh, distal femur, and then here is your tibial tubercle right here. And you can see there's the damage. And this one's even worse. So patella, femur, tibia, tibial tubercle. And you've got this diseased process going on. You see, notice here you can see, you can actually in this one you can see the the ligament from the uh, quadriceps coming right in and in, where it inserts on the uh, tibial tubercle. I don't know if you could see that on the other, yeah, you, you couldn't see that as clearly on the other one. Here you can see that quadriceps ligament coming right in and attaching on the tibial tubercle. So this is a really good picture. Alright, so just to recap Developmental dysplasia of the hip. This is a newborn uh, presentation, although it may present in older uh, babies, toddlers. Uh, it, it could present as a limp if it's a uh, baby over a year of age. It tends to present in the newborn. Things that you see with this, girl, firstborn, breach, positive Ortolani sign on that newborn examination. Diagnosis is a sonography. However, you can get a pelvic x-ray if it's an older child. Treatment is going to be a pavlic harness if they're younger than six months because we've got time to work with uh, all of those ligaments and bones because they're still developing. However, if they're uh, six, six months to two years of age, then we're going to need to do a closed reduction. And if they're older than two years of age, we'll do an open reduction. Septic arthritis is, of course, a bacterial infection. It's most commonly seen of, it's very commonly seen in children, but out of all children, it's most commonly seen in toddlers and in the hip. The uh, signs that you'll see around this are joint pain, fever, effusion, increased erythrocyte sedimentation rate. How do we diagnose this? To confirm the diagnosis, we analyze the synovial fluid. We're going to have to do this under anesthesia to get the tap most of the times, but uh, the synovial fluid should show elevated white blood cells, and uh, we're going to want to culture that too. The treatment is going to be joint decompression as well as IV antibiotics, and we point those antibiotics towards Staphylococcus aureus, which is the number one cause. Leg calvae perthes, we tend to see this in elementary school age children. Uh, the history is going to be knee pain or limp. It could be a painless limp, but oftentimes with leg calvae perthes and skiffy, they're both hip disorders that if they have pain, it can refer to the knee and may even present as knee pain. But leg calvae perthes tends to be less painful, may even be no pain. But the limp is, what, uh, is, what, is what's going to draw you to this. Diagnosis is going to be on pelvic x-ray and it's also going to help you differentiate this from Skiffy. For treatment, we do closed, redu closed reduction uh, and casting if we do any treatment at all. With Skiffy, this is a much more emergent diagnosis and uh, this we tend to see in adolescents. 
uh, they have a painful limp, they often have knee pain, usually the child is going to tell their parent, hey, I hurt, I want to go see the doctor. Whereas leg cavity perthes, you might not see that. Painful limp, knee pain, a lot of times we see this in chubby kids, but they could also be really, really lanky kids too. Diagnosis here is pelvic x-ray. What we're going to notice with Skiffy is a dislocation at the growth plate. Whereas in leg cavity perthes, we see a vascular calcified necrosis at the femoral head. To treat Skiffy, we do open reduction and screwing. So we screw that uh, femoral head to the femoral neck so the uh, everything's in alignment so that as the femur continues to grow, it grows normally so we don't have any uh, abnormal leg lengths. And then finally, osgood Schlatter, we tend to see in adolescence. This is strictly of the knee. So you'll see knee pain, especially on kneeling, and it's in the athlete. On physical exam, you'll be able to reproduce this pain by palpating the tibial tubercle. Diagnosis, this is done clinically. However, you can get an x-ray to corroborate your diagnosis. For treatment, it's simply rest, ice, compression, elevation, and NSAIDs for the pain. And that's it.